Uh, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. Okay. Uh, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, sorry. Um, I <laughs> may I invite you to take your seats, please. Thank you very much. Um, so good evening to you and a uh, warm welcome to the Cape Town Holocaust Genocide Center. Um, I am Richard Friedman. I am the chairman of the Board of Trustees. Uh, fellow trustee uh, Myra Osram is also here. Uh, we have some of our educators, uh, some of our volunteers, other luminaries like Professor Robbins over there. Uh, and of course, you ladies and gentlemen, um, you are most welcome. And I think a very special um, evening is in store for us. So you are the fortunate few that made, decided to make this, uh, this effort here this evening. Uh, if I may just have a personal reflection, um, I went to Sachsenhausen, I think it was 20, um, 14 or 13, and uh, I was privileged enough to chair a, a panel there, and that was my first uh, encounter with uh, Dr. Lay um, at what I thought was probably one of the most extraordinary uh, memorial exhibitions I've ever been to, and I had been to a few uh, around Germany and also uh, in Poland. Um, but I had not seen anything quite like Saxon Hausen. And um, when I realized also that Astrid had been involved in the development of some of the permanent exhibitions, particularly the one on medicine, um, it was a dream that when we had our deadly medicine exhibition, that Astrid would be able to come, but it wasn't possible. Then she was booked to come, I think, the year before last, and that also wasn't possible because of COVID. So this is really third time lucky and wonderfully lucky. I attended part of your workshop this morning, which you gave to the uh, volunteers and the educators here at the center. And I have to say, um, they, they were just riveted by what you had to say. And over the years, I've been privileged to meet some of your colleagues uh, also, uh, people that you've worked with on this particular field of yours, which is uh, the, the, the intersection of uh, Nazi ideology and, um, and health, I suppose, or medicine, but very broadly in that sense. And really, Astrid is one of the world's um, authorities. And it really, and you've dedicated many, many years to the subject, um, your PhD, um, was in fact, um, um, yeah, I, the title is here, I'm just looking for it, Compulsory Sterilization and the Medical Profession on the Involvement of German Doctors in the Nazi Sterilization Program, 1934 to 1945. So that was really the, the I suppose, the first manifest, public manifestation of the work. But um, with your exhibitions, the, um, the Brandenburg involvement, the Brandenburg uh, on, the, on the Havel, the Euthanasia Memorial, um, other many, many other uh, publications and, and, and studies. Um, we are very privileged to have you here this evening. And I am particularly pleased to also be able to, against the backdrop of your uh, talk this evening, to launch our. Um, new traveling exhibition. And uh, it's very wonderful to have Linda Hackner here, who is the former education director, um, who has handed over to Audie Barnett, who's our new education director. But Linda drove this project, and this is the first time she's seen it. And it's going to be a wonderful tool um, in the years ahead, I have no doubt, um, in the programs that we run. And of course, it deals. Um, with the victims, the other victims, uh, apart from the Jewish victims, and of course, uh, the, the uh, euthanasia program. I'm just looking at 
the picture there, which is, of course, exactly what your work has been done at the bottom there. Um, is, uh, is a whole section on the disabled and domestic program. So with that rather sort of brief introduction, um, uh, I would like to ask Astrid to come and uh, address us on euthanasia as a prelude to the Holocaust, Jewish patients in the Operation T4, because as she pointed out to us this morning, one knows about the T4 program, but one does not know the actual details of the targeting of Jewish individuals in that program. And so I think your talk is going to be of great interest to us. And thank you. I'd like to hand over to you now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Richard, for the kind words in my introduction. Thank you very much uh, all, to all of you for coming and for your interest in what I have to say. Um, the family of an Israeli friend of mine, which originated in Latvia but later lived in Hamburg in Germany, and immigrated to Eres Israel in 1935. My friend's grandfather, Tobias Wechsler, with his four children, Jakob, Abraham, Esther, Esther, and Max. Only grandmother, Sonja Wechsler, did not go. Later on, no one in the family ever mentioned her name. Only once my friend's father spoke about her briefly, saying that she had died in 1922. My friend therefore assumed that his grandmother had died while giving birth to her youngest son, Max. Then he heard that she had died to tuberculosis in 1929 only to be later told that he, by his uncle that she died in 1934 in a mental hospital. My friend sensed that something bad must have happened in his family, a dark secret which was concealed but had cast a heavy shadow over all of their lives. My friend wanted to know what had happened to his grandmother and finally found out that Sophie was murdered in 1940 as part of the euthanasia program T4. She had been placed in a psychiatric ward in Hamburg in 1930 and her husband and children left her there when fleeing to Palestine in 1935. On September the 23rd, 1940, she was transferred to the killing center at Brandenburg on the river Havel, one of six euthanasia institutions in the German Reich. She was killed in the gas chamber there on the same day. Thus, she shared the fate of at least 2,000 Jewish psychiatric patients who became victims of the action T4. The fact that also Jewish patients were murdered during the Nazi euthanasia program is largely unknown in Israel and Germany still today. Even experts believe that the murder of patients was limited to non-Jewish German patients. During his research, my friend got the impression that the society does not want to know and that these victims are excluded from public memorial culture, and indeed, 
both in Israel and in Germany, Jewish patients murdered in the euthanasia program belong to the so-called forgotten victims. In my presentation today, I want to speak about the T4 special campaign against Jewish patients in the context of Nazi euthanasia programs and in the way mental patients were dealt with during the Nazi regime. By doing so, I want to point out that the T4 special campaign against Jewish patients must be considered as a prelude to the Holocaust, as a terrible first step on the way to the genocide against the European Jews. First, a few words on the so-called Operation T4, um, a killing campaign, which was the, the, the uh, abbreviation T4 comes from Tiergartenstraße 4, Tiergarten Street 4. This was the street in Berlin where the central administration of the so-called euthanasia program was located. The active killing of the ill and the handicapped was not an idea of the National Socialists. Long before 1933, euthanasia and assisted death had been discussed in, for certain cases, both for both racial as well as economic reasons. But it was only the Nazi regime that actually put such ideas into practice. On the whole, around 300,000 people fell victim to various crimes, crimes committed in the name of euthanasia in the German Reich and in the occupied, German occupied territories. The most well known Nazi euthanasia crime was the Operation T4, taking place between 1940 and 1941, in which around 70,000 patients in the German Reich were murdered by poisonous gas. The planning and execution of euthanasia murders was carried out by Adolf Hitler's private agency as uh, the Fuhrer. Um, of the Nazi party in close cooperation with the Ministry of the Interior. So it was a mixture. There was on the one hand, you had this old traditional state elites of Germany, like the Ministry of the Interior, and you had the Nazi party. It was not a crime just like only by the Nazi party. It was uh, also involved, strongly involved, the Ministry of the Interior and all the uh, states, uh, traditional state, state bureaucracy bureaucracy of Germany. The Ministry of the Interior sent out registration forms to hospital and nursing homes all over the German Reich. An accompanying leaflet specified what patients were supposed to be recorded. The criteria included certain medical conditions, the duration of the stay in the institution, possible criminal acts, as well as employment. Jewish patients and those of foreign citizenship had to be registered without exception. So not all the non-Jewish uh, patients were registered, but all the Jewish patients. The completed registration forms were sent to three so-called T4 experts for assessment and around 40 of the most respected psychiatrists in Germany had to had asked, uh, had been recruited for this task. They were getting the forms and were selecting what patients uh, could go on living and which one did not have a right to live in their point of view and were to be murdered. The forms of the patients selected for murder were forwarded to the T4 office at Tiergartenstraße 4, uh, Tiergartenstraße 4, which organized the patients' transports to the killing centers. Six killing centers were set up in Germany uh, to murder the patients. You have them here on the map. And this Brandenburg Havel is actually very close to Berlin. It was the first killing center to be sent, set up. And uh, this is the place, Richard mentioned it, where I put up the memorial uh, on the T4. So there were Brandenburg on the River Herve, Grafenegg um, in, in the very south. Um, 
uh, how time near Linz, it was actually on former Austrian ground. It was uh, in, in, in the German um, annexed uh, Austria, thank you. Pirma um in the east, and then a Bernburg on the river Havel, river Saale, sorry, and Hadamar near, actually near Frankfurt, near Limburg, Frankfurt line um, in the west. From January 1940 to August 1941, more than 70,000 people were killed in the gas chambers of the six euthanasia institutions with carbon monoxide. This is a difference to the later gas chambers in Auschwitz, for example. The mass murder could not be kept secret permanently. There were protests which were primarily held by the German Christian churches. In order to avoid public unrest, Operation T4 was stopped by Hitler in the end of August of 1941. But in actual fact, the murder of patients continued by other means and in a much larger ex extent until way beyond until the end of the war. Now coming to the next topic, the so-called T4 special campaign, this is how researchers call it, um, against Jewish patients. Jewish psychiatric patients after 1933, when Hitler, uh, the Nazis had come to power, faced a double threat. First, they, like all Jews in Germany and later Europe, were threatened by anti-Semitic persecution that prevailed after Hitler had come to power. But besides that, they, as mental patients, were secondly uh, treated or threatened by the hereditary hygiene and so-called racial hygiene measures of the Nazi and German health and social system. First step was is called discrimination and exclusion. Uh, the special anti-Semitic laws that turned Jews into second-class people and drove them out of the public as well as out of business life also applied for Jewish patients. From 1939 on, they, like all Germans, had no Jewish first names as recognized by the states. And uh, the people who had no Jewish names as recognized by the states were forced to take on the additional names of Sarah and Israel, or Sarah for women, Israel for men. In, in addition, they had to carry specific identification cards. And here you have such an, ident an example for such an identification card, uh, which belonged to Käthe Hirsch. Um, uh, Katie Hirsch um, was admitted to the Municipal State Hospital and Nursing Home in Berlin, which is now in 1931, and was moved to the State Institution of Neurofin in Brandenburg in 1938, where she died a year later, according to the official statement uh, due to peritonitis. And we see um, um, there is a I want to show you something that I now don't see it myself. No, she was, yeah, this is um, valued till January 1944, but she had died um, at that time already. Uh, this uh, it says here. Um, Unchangeable, like um, unchangeable characteristics, physical characteristics. Hakenab, it's a hook nose. This is this um, this is this topos, uh, anti-Semitic topos to identify Jewish people, and they wrote it here. I don't know what to show you. Um, and it, it also says, um, uh, with, uh, Sarah, here we have it, that she, sorry, uh, that she was Kate, this was her original name, uh, Hirsch, but, but Sarah 
was the name she had to take on. And, and the big J, this is here. Yeah. This is saying who would be. So, and these were the specific identification cards these people had to, to carry, uh, showing everyone that they were considered to be Jewish. Um, in the institutions, Sarah was patient of an institution, for example, specific Jewish card index cards were kept and the files of the patients were specifically marked. The special separation of Jewish and non-Jewish patients was decreased by the bureaucracy, but however, not consistently implemented, mainly due to financial reasons. The German and the institutions wanted to spatially separate Jewish and non-Jewish patients, but not all the institutions had the necessary space. Our next example, this is a, the patient file of a patient uh, called Rosalie Damsica, um, uh, born in 1856, who died in 1939. Rosalie Damsica was admitted to the State Institute of Non Ropin. Non Ropin is a town, town north of Berlin. After a brief stay at Herzberger Hospital in Berlin in 1924, in 1939, she died according, according to official statements of old age and degeneration of the heart muscle. And here we see. Um, Jewish, Jewish. So, also her name here is, uh, we have it, Sarah, again. Um, Jewish patients were treated differently from non Jewish patients, also within the so called Operation T4. As of summer 1940, Jewish patients, regardless of their illness or prognosis or ability to work, I told you the, the selection criteria for non-Jewish patients were according whether they could work, how the prognosis was, whether they received um, visitors, whether they were could be used in uh, for work in the institution, like uh, men usually were used for gardening works and, and women in the kitchen. This didn't apply to Jewish they were patients. Jewish patients were, regardless of their illness, prognosis, ability to work, killed solely because they were, because of their Jewish origin. The first scheduled mass murder in the German Reich began in Brandenburg an der Hafe. This is uh, this uh, killing center we saw next to Berlin. And the few Jewish patients who survived the operation T4 were later killed in extermination camps. So this was kind of a first genocide which took place on the, the soil of uh, Germany, on the German ground. Yeah. When they started really pumping up the program in 1940 under cover of war, were they still seeing um, your child died of uh, liver failure or kidney or whatever. Yeah, yeah. They still did that. Yeah, so yeah, they yeah. still did. They did it. Mm -hmm. uh, and with the Jewish patients, they did a specific form of it. And we will later um, look at it. But but this is this was she died before the T4. Yeah. Uh, but one can assume that um, she didn't live very long in, in institutional care because the Jewish patients were. Definitely fit worse um, uh, than other uh, other patients, so the li the living conditions weren't too good in these institutions. So she probably died before her time. Okay. So we come to the to to the bullet point. Brandenburg in July 1940 has um, been the site of the first mass murder of Jewish Jews in the German Reich. The preparations for the systematic killing of Jewish patients started in the spring of 1940. The program of murder began in Berlin, the capital of the German Reich. 
where in July 1940, all the inmates of the institutions from whole Berlin and Brandenburg, this is the state surrounding Berlin, uh, who were regarded as so-called full Jews, were concentrated at the Berlin Hospital. I hope I have the picture. Maybe not. Uh, yeah, this is a, it, it, it's a bit, I'm sorry for showing you this, this uh, German document. It's not um, easily to see, but this is a, a directive of the governor of the province of, province of Brandenburg to, the, to one of these institutions uh, to um, report all German, all so-called full Jews of German nationality um, or Polish nationality, which were regarded as stateless. So we can see here, um, uh, it, it, it is, um, there has been reached an agreement uh, by, by the town of Berlin that immediately all stateless, um, uh, uh, no, uh, that immediately all Jews from the Brandenburg um, institutions have to be transferred to this. This is a, a government. This is not a Nazi uh, party uh, organization. This is the German government. And we see how far they were included and knew about it. Um, in the Berlin Buch State Hospital, um, the so called, uh, so called fortified house, which until then had housed mentally ill criminals and violent patients, was now being used as a so called collective institution. <coughs> this is a specific thing that they first brought these people to so called collective institution and kind of also conceal the way that had been, they had to take. Um, and this was used as a so called collective institution for Jewish patients from the beginning of July 1940 on. And from there, they were later allegedly moved to an external institution. When you look at the files, at the patient files, the patient files give you, um, for every day, there's an entry, where, how whether these people slept good or well, what, what did they eat? And they, they all end in one sentence, moved to an external institution. And uh, researchers on, on, on the T4 program are looking for this specific sentence in order to find out who had been killed. Um, yeah, so um, due to this, uh, the patients find they were moved to an um, external institution. But what we have, and this is quite a, 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 a very interesting document, this is the diary of, of the head physician of the Brandenburg and the Harper Killing Center, Wilfried Eber, who was of Austrian nationality, a very early Nazi, and he became, in a quite a young age, became the, the leading physician of the Brandenburg and the Harper Killing Center. And he later became the first uh, commander of, of Treblinka extermination camp. So it shows this, this, per, this transfer of uh, persons stuff at, from the T4 campaign to the Reinhardt campaign. Uh, and uh, Abel, he was marking all the incoming transports in his diary. So you always have uh, gives the name of the hospitals they're coming from. And when he puts this J, uh, sometimes even puts numbers, uh, then uh, the transports are uh, only consists of Jewish patients. This was very important to find, as, as, as I later will point out to you, the concealment made the families believe that these people were transported to the East for a long time, because the death certificates were later sent from Poland in order to conceal this murder. And only the finding of this, um, this document, which was Eber was Actually, he was caught immediately after the, the war ended because um, he, I don't know, he fled to, to Swabia. He wanted to work as a doctor again. Uh, the the denazification committee found out that there was something wrong with him. And uh, they put him to prison and he committed suicide in prison. But all his materials 
were in a house in Berlin. And since it was in the French section of Berlin, no one had access. And it was only uh, during this Auschwitz trial of Fritz Bauers that they got access to this um, papers of, of Eber where this uh, uh, diary was found. And only by this diary we can prove that the Jewish patients were actually not murdered in Poland, but on the grounds of the German Reich. Eber, like, like I said, recorded transports arriving at Brandenburg in his diary. In each case, he noted down the institution the patients had come from as well as whether they were men or women, female or men. We don't have this in this example here, unfortunately, um, but there's uh, other examples where we have it. And according to current knowledge, knowledge more than 400 patients from the Berlin-Brandenburg region uh, were killed during the so-called special campaign. And the special campaign was then extended to the whole German Reich from the Brandenburg Berlin region from end of August 1940 on further collection, so called collection institutions for Jewish patients in Germany were set up, including institutions in Hamburg, Egelfing uh, Haar, uh, which is in Bavaria, Am Steinhof, which is in Vienna, Gießen in Hesse, and uh, the so called Wunstorf, which is in the province of Hanover. And all the Jewish patients only stayed a few days. They were brought from their, transferred from their institutions to this collective institutions where they stayed a few days before they were picked up by the T4 transport organization. It was an own organization which was running with gray buses. I don't know whether we have, no, we don't have a picture of it, but we had a picture on the, on the invitation. Um, which actually showed, showed a red bus because in the very beginning there, there were former post buses and in the very early transports, the buses were still red. And this is where this photo dates from, uh, originates from, but later they were um, painted gray. And this gray bus has become a synonym for the transporting people to the police. The families of the transferred and killed Jewish patients were long left in dark where their relatives had been taken to. On inquiry, they were told that the patients had been transferred to the general government. This was the term the Germans called the occupied parts of Poland by general government. Um, as of autumn 1940, the T4 headquarters even sent out notifications of death with a sender given as lunatic asylum Holm, um, near Lublin in Poland uh, for the Jewish patients that had in reality been killed in Brandenburg month before. The letters came together with death certificates to answer your question issued by a Holm registry office. In actual fact, these papers had been drawn up in Berlin, set up in, drawn up in Berlin, and had been sent to Lublin in Poland by Korea so that they could be sent back to the relatives from the Lublin authorities. So that then uh, National Socialists did quite an effort to conceal this um, crime. So we have. Thank <laughs> you. Um, we have here the uh, example of Agnes Simpf. Um, we have a photo of Agnes Simpf, um, born in 1857, who was killed in, in Brandenburg Killing Center in 1940. This is a photo of her sitting on, on the coffee table in 1920. And um, her relatives asked uh, at the um, uh, institution where she had been held, what happened to her, where is she, why is she no longer in, in the institution, and this, this letter says, answering your letter by this and this date, I tell you that Agnes Semp, um, like many other Jewish 
uh, in, uh, patients from our institutions have been on the order of the of the Reichsverteidigungskommissar, which is the, um, the, um, the for the, the Reich War uh, Commissioner um, Commissar in charge for I don't know putting the German um, the German society all the dealing with all the all the issues that, that have come up with the war um, with effect on, on Germany and, and the German population. So they said on the order of this vice commissar, um, uh, she has been put to the general government uh, near Warsaw. Um, so if you if you want to ask, please write right to there. So the actual fact she lived in Germany. She had been murdered in Germany. Yeah, right. This is it, it, it's interesting to me that the name has been filled into a standard yeah, form. Yeah. So that suggests it was used over and over again. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but like, like I said, there were about 400 victims from the Berlin region. So they copied this form and just typed, typed the name. And this is, this relatives got this, and everybody who could think could see um, that this is not a single case. Um, yeah, on, on just a little bit of background on, on Agnes Sim, um, age-related psychiatric changes um, made it necessary to admit Agnes Sim, who was already 82 years when she was admitted to the um, mental hospital to Berlin Buch Institution in 1939. One year later, she was transferred to another Berlin institution along with other Jewish patients and non-Jewish patients, but she remained there only a few weeks. And in July 1940, like all the Jewish patients, she was transferred back to Berlin, where she had been staying before as a normal patient, as a collective institution for Jewish patients, which had been there, established there in the meantime. Shortly after that, she was taken along with other Jewish patients to the killing center at Brandenburg and murdered. Um, yeah, we have seen this, the communication from the main health office in Berlin. Um, this guy, uh, Hans um, uh, Schäfer, who signed it, um, supposed that Agnes Sim had been transferred to the general government in Warsaw. This is the next. Um, um, this is now the, the notification of the death of Agnes Sim, which the family received. We see that uh, the letterhead says uh, um, psychiatric hospital in Köln, Post Lublin. Um, and it, it is sent to Mr. Schäfer, who was um, a relative uh, or, or the, I don't know, even the, perhaps the person in charge sometimes. People that are mentally ill, they get somebody a caretaker. Uh, I think he was the caretaker. I'm not really remembered exactly. Uh, living in Charlottenburg, this is uh, where I also live. So many Jewish um, people were living in, in Charlottenburg, and it says um, he had written to, to, to the to the institution where she was, asking for her and. Um, uh, answering your, your letter, I'm, I'm telling you that the patient Agnes Simf, uh, born here and there, blah, 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 uh, who was uh, pro, pro, brought to us a longer time ago, um, uh, had died on the 30th of January, 1941, due to a heart attack. Um, okay, um, unexpectedly, died unexpectedly. In unexpectedly of a heart attack. And um, the next is the death certificate, which also kind of says the same thing, Agnes uh, all the data, and, and then um, died. Um, and the, the death was reported by the head of the Colm Mental Institutions and uh, the, the cause of death. Is uh, due to age 
heart attack, heart attack related to an older age. Um, the transport, like we know from the from the um, diary of um, uh, Irmfried Eber from Buch in Berlin, had arrived in Brandenburg on the 17th of July. Uh, death was certified for the end of January 1941, so it was half a year later. Even Tobias Wechsler, the grandfather of my uh, aforementioned Israeli friend, was informed that his wife, Sophie, had been transferred to Köln uh, when trying to find out about her whereabouts from his new home in Jerusalem in 1935. He wrote to Germany in 1942. He nevertheless kept Sophie's fate secret, being unable to overcome his feelings of guilt, shame, and grief. Sophie was therefore uh, forgotten and repressed for more than 70 years. Like I told, showed you with this example of Agnes Semp, there was quite a, a time had passed until the actual killing of a person and till the, the date which was given as a date of death in the death certificate. Why so? Because the T4 campaign also had a, a financial side. Um, the, for the care of Jewish patients um, in this fictionous calm lunatic asylum, which did not exist at all, the persons were already dead, and the relatives and the right association of the Jews in Germany, which was forcibly established in 1939, and which was a funding body for the free Jewish charitable organizations. These organizations had to continue pay maintenance for money. By the virtue of the falsified details of the death in the, of the Jewish victims, the T4 headquarters probably obtained several hundred thousand of Reichsmarks. So in the case of um, uh, Agnes Senf, uh, it was for six months that uh, the, the charitable um, uh, Jewish organizations had to pay every month that she was uh, housed and, 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 and fed in a, for a patient that had been murdered for months. Um, in September 1941, the Reich Association had already received more than a thousand notifications of deaths in Köln, showing us that there was quite, this is just the number of notifications we know of. This is the, the minimum number of patients um, killed and who's, who were allegedly um, um, had died in, in Köln. According to current research, we know that at least one Nine, 1,900 Jewish psychiatric patients fell victim to, uh, to the T4 operation. Um, how did it go on? The, the T4 uh, campaign was stopped and this, uh, this um, campaign against Jewish patients was a timely limited campaign till all the mentally ill Jewish patients were murdered. But like you know, people go on to develop uh, mental um, situations. So new patients come up. Um, yeah, basically from December 1940 on, mentally ill Jews were allowed only to be admitted in the so-called Israeli hospital in Dendorf Sein near Koblenz. Koblenz is in the very west of Germany. There was one hospital for all Jewish mentally ill patients in whole Germany. This shows that hardly anyone had survived. The small institution at times took care of more than 500 patients. After the deportation of the German Jews started in October 1941, nearly all Bendorf 
patients were deported in the spring of 1942. This is the uh, picture of the Bendorf Sign um, uh, Hospital and a photo of uh, Dr. Wilhelm Rosenau, who was the chief physician of the Israeli hospital in Bendorf Sign. Um, he was a psychiatrist uh, uh, from Silesia um, and uh, took over as the head of the Israeli hospital in Bendorf Sign, like the few other doctors with a Jewish background still permitted to work as doctors. And uh, he was permitted only to treat Jewish patients. Um, he was no longer allowed to call himself a doctor, but only a carer of the sick. He survived the National Socialist persecution thanks to his marriage to a non-Jew and the intervention of a non-Jewish manager of the hospital. At the end of 1942, Bendorf Sign Hospital was closed because all the patients had been deported and a special department for mentally ill was uh, set up in the Jewish hospital in Berlin. We see a, a picture of the entrance to the gynecological clinic of this um, um, institution here, uh, the Jewish um, uh, hospital in Berlin. And um, the sign says, uh, as of October 1938, only Jewish patients are treated here. Um, and uh, so um, in the summer of 1942, they quickly set up psychiatric ward with 120 beds was there. The conditions were primitive. There was a lack of trained persona. Uh, the patients, for the patients, this clinic was any way just immediate station in 1942, all the patients were deported to the so-called East, to the killing centers. And uh, the last transport went to the Theresienstadt ghetto and left on um, November 1943. The department in Berlin was then closed. There were no um, Jewish patients anymore. Um, yeah, this is um, in um, Theresienstadt ghetto. Um, a hospital with a psychiatric unit was established in the so called Cavalier barracks in 1942. And um, the patients who were housed there did not die of hunger or infectious diseases. They were later transported to Auschwitz from Theresienstadt to Auschwitz concentration camp at the extermination camp. And we have here a drawing uh, of this Cavalier barracks uh, by um, a former inmate of Theresienstadt concentration camp and ghetto. And this is a transportation list uh, from Theresienstadt to Auschwitz, which lists um, a transport of um, the last uh, patients, um, mentally ill patients, and the medical staff that could, took care of them. And it left the ghetto in March 1944, the transport DX to Auschwitz. The special campaign against Jewish patients is regarded as one of several links between the euthanasia and the Holocaust, which proved the significance of the Nazis' murders of patients for the later genocide against the European Jews. From the very beginning of Operation T4, individual Jewish patients were integrated in the killing program, but from 19, April 1940 on, all Jewish mentally ill in inpatient care in the whole Reich were systematically registered and later spatially separated from um, in several collective institutions. In the course of the so-called T4 special campaign, which lasted from two, July till December 1940, up to 2,500 patients were murdered. And according to current research, 
Um, like I said, 1.9, um, uh, so 1,900 victims are documented in historical sources. And of 1,700 around, they have, we are able to namely identify the, the people. The T4 special campaign against Jewish patients was the first systematic mass murders, murder of German Jews during the Nazi regime and therefore represents an important connection between the euthanasia and the Holocaust. A further link between the euthanasia and the Holocaust is seen in the usage of the noxious ga gas. Already in the uh, euthanasia program, the victims were murdered by means of gas, which became the signature of the Nazi genocide of the European Jews. After the stop of the T4 campaign in August 1941, uh, the euthanasia personnel transferred the T4 killing technology to the Nazi extermination camps in the East. And many men like Jungfried Eberl, we heard about, of the T4 killing stuff later assumed key positions when it came to the killing of the Jews reported to the so-called general government in 1942. In a sense, the victims of the T4 special campaign of um, the uh, Jewish patients were murdered twice. As mentally ill, who were considered being life unworthy living, like the Nazis <coughs> called it, and as Jews persecuted against on the ground on ethnic, ethnic racism. For many years, the Jewish T4 victims had been forgotten. In Germany, where euthanasia victims principally only recently have no longer been counted among the forgotten victims, and in Israel, where these mentally ill fitted even less into the image of the young, the self-image of the young state, Israeli state, than ordinary Holocaust victims, and where even today they do not appear in the remembrance culture. Thus, the family history of the Wechslers represents a long ignored chapter of Jewish European history. On March 29, 2016, about 20 family members of the Wechslers traveled to Hamburg in order to lay a stumbling stone for Sophie Wechsler. They saw this as a chance to ask their grandmother for forgiveness. The ceremony was the first step to lift the shadow which was casting over the family for such a long time. Thank you. Astrid, on behalf of all of us at the Victim of Podcast and Genocide Center, I'd like to thank you so much for your insightful lecture. Um, this is a very um, interesting topic that is not widely told. 